Right, I think we'll start by taking time fill, huh? Namaskara. Buddhang Saranang Gachami Dhammang Saranang Gachami Sanghang Saranang Gachami Duteyampi Buddhang Saranang Gachami Duteyampi Dhammang Saranang Gachami Duteyampi Sanghang Saranang Gachami Tateyampi Buddhang Saranang Gachami Tateyampi Dhammang Saranang Gachami Tate ampi sanghang saranang gachami saranagamanang sampunang panati pasta veramani si ka padam samadiyami adina dana veramani si ka padam samadiyami Kame sumi cha chara ve ramani si ka padam samadhyami. Musa vada ve ramani si ka padam samadhyami. Sura meriam majapamadatana ve ramani si ka padam samadhyami. Kisarane na sadhim pancha silang damang sadukang surakitang kasva pamadena sampadeta. We live in a world today which is in transition. It's changing rapidly. When I was a child, television had never been heard of. There's hardly a child left on this globe that has never heard of television. Going to the moon was a fairy tale. It's a reality today. This is within the lifespan, or less than a lifespan, in the last 50 years. The transition in our technology, in our sciences, has been such that the ordinary person cannot keep pace with it. Computer is a household word. In fact, it has become a household gadget. I personally don't know how to operate it. But the young people of today, they think it is as a matter of course. And what the computer as such has opened up for us in new advances in technology we can't even dream about yet. The microchip, which is nowadays the size of a pinhead, has altered the very fabric of our lives. And yet, hasn't made anybody happy. There is as much happiness now, or as little of it, as there has ever been. But in this world of transition in which we live, I think we need to think of Buddhism in transition also. We need to get away from the old established rules, mores, and traditions, and open up our hearts and minds to the spirit of it. In other words, we must no longer keep our eyes strictly on the letter of it. 
This has been done for generations. The letter of it is embedded within the books and within the rites and rituals. And that has become not only stale, but it has become solidified. There is no movement in it. You cannot change a book. You do not change a rite or a ritual because it's always been done that way. And when there is no change, when there is no movement, then it doesn't have life. Life as such is change and movement. So we need to have a new look at what Buddhism means to us today. Not only because our times are special, all times are special, but because if we do not make a real effort to have live Dhamma, it will die. There are only two possibilities. Either one is alive or dead. Half dead or half alive isn't good enough. Only when we take up the Buddha's teaching from where they came from, from his own words, and try to see them as meaningful for ourselves, can we make a change, can we bring it to life. And bringing it to life will then be our own world in transition. Unless we do that, we're left behind. We are puzzled of the what has been, the past. Once there may have been glory, once there may have been the light of the Dhamma, but unless it starts shining in the heart, it dies out. And it can never live in ritual, it can never live in building, it can never live in repetition, it can never live in books. We've got to come to the spirit of it, so that this world that we live in, which is full of scientific advances and full of emotional difficulties and full of moral disintegration, that this world that we know will also have a transition for the future which brings with it the true Dhamma. Now, we are, this present generation, are the bridge between the one that has been and the one that is to come. We are in between those that are dead and those that are not yet born. Now, those that are not yet born, if they are to inherit the heritage which the Buddha left for us, we have to present it to them. We have to be the ones that give it. And what are we giving? Are we giving it from our own experience, from our own hearts, or are we giving just some words that we have learned, or are we forgetting the whole thing? Unless we are the transmitters of the Dhamma, this generation that is alive today, the Dhamma will undoubtedly die. What else should happen? And then it cannot be resurrected until another Buddha arises, which will be eons from now. Now, although time is a relative concept and has no real meaning, it is still our duty and our responsibility 
to get delve into the spirit of the Buddha's teaching and make them real. <clears throat> if we don't do that, then we are failing in our responsibility towards those that are to come. We are breaking the chain. And because of this transition that we live in, the one towards scientific and technological advancement, we have got very much sidetracked. Life has become more comfortable. It is far more comfortable than it was maybe a hundred or two hundred years ago, and that's only a short time ago. There is less work to do in the house because there are advances in technology. We can move about easily because there are motor cars. We don't have to walk everywhere. The Buddha walked everywhere. He never used a ox car or a horse-drawn vehicle because he didn't want to give the burden of his weight to an animal. So he walked. There was no other choice. We don't walk. We have all sorts of ways of getting about without having to walk. And because of the many distractions, television, movies, innumerable books, telephones, traveling, planes, because of these innumerable distractions, it is even more difficult today to get to the spirit of the Dhamma because the mind does not settle down to introspect. It goes outward all the time into all the interesting aspects the newness of what's written in newspapers and magazines, even magazines in the last 50 years have taken on such an enormous bug as has never been heard of before. What can be bought at a newsstand today is unbelievable compared to what was available 50 years ago. We have far more sensual pleasures available. And they are di diametrically opposed to what the Buddha taught. So it is quite possible that unless more people actually start taking the Dhamma to heart rather than to the mouth, that this generation may not leave the heritage to the next one that it should. The Dhamma is not a stereotyped set of phrases. The Dhamma is not embedded in the Pali language. The Dhamma has to be embedded in the heart. And that means that one's priority in life is one's own purification for the benefit of oneself and all around one. Simple enough, isn't it? Difficult to do. And ever more difficult because of all that besets us from outside. Unless we take time out from our busy schedules that everybody has, take time out deliberately and introspect, delve inside and get in touch with one's own heart and mind. One's never going to find what it means that there is dukkha and that dukkha has only one cause, namely craving. We may know the Four Noble Truths, Baha, backward and forward, in English, Singhala, Pali, or whatever other languages we know. But unless we look into our own heart and find it there, we don't know them. And that means, in the Buddha's language, that we are ignorant. Avijja, ignorant, means nothing else except 
ignoring the four noble truths. It doesn't mean that we haven't gone to school, it doesn't mean that we haven't learned our ABCs, it doesn't mean that we haven't got any education, it means nothing of the sort. All it means is that we are ignoring the four noble truths. And of course we are all ignoring the third one. We are ignoring it to the point of not even believing that it is possible. There is very often the pious exclamation, especially about those dear dead departed ones, to say, may they attain Nibbana as soon as they can, or may they attain Nibbana in this life, or anything like that. It's a pious exclamation, and nobody really takes it seriously. Nobody thinks they're doing anything about it. It's almost like saying, I hope you're feeling well. May one attain Nibbana is hard work. And one has to be prepared to do that hard work. So when we are ignoring the Four Noble Truths, we are willfully and deliberately ignoring the third one. And there's no harm in that if we do not ignore the fourth one. If we actually live up to the fourth noble truth, namely following the Noble Eightfold Path, then we are on the way to Nirvana. And whether we are ignoring it for the time being or not, doesn't matter, because we don't know it yet, so we cannot really put our mind to it. But we can put our mind to the fact that it is the only worthwhile thing in life to do. There are two things that one can do in life, and only two. And that makes it so nice and simple. We can either go after our pleasurable sense contact, or we can go after Nibbana. We don't have any other choice. And you need to investigate that and think about it, and see whether you can find a third choice. And if you do, well, maybe it's a good one. You see, our senses are six. We have the five senses plus thinking. We want to have pleasures through those six senses. Through the seeing, the hearing, tasting, touching and smelling and the thinking. And if we don't get pleasure that way, we want to run away, we want to get away from it. We have several ways of dealing with the displeasure. Either we remove ourselves or we try to remove that which gives us the displeasure. Or we become sorry for ourselves. Why should it happen to me? I've never done anything bad. Or we become depressed by it. Very unhappy, depressed. Or we blame whoever, whatever, is causing the displeasure. Or we try to drown it out. These are the popular ways of dealing with dukkha. Being sorry for oneself, being depressed, blaming whatever we think causes it, running away from it or drowning it out. Drowning it out through all manner of ways. Going on a trip, telephoning the neighbor, reading a book, watching television, going to the movies, having a chat with the neighbors over coffee, anything, just to drown it out. This is, of course, no way to deal with Dukkha. The only way to deal with Dukkha is to investigate it. To get in there and see it and know why it has come. And if we do that, at least we're acknowledging the first noble truth. We're not ignoring it. We're not trying to run away from it. We're acknowledging it. We're saying, oh yes, of course, Dukkha is. And maybe then we'll also get the idea that we are not singled out, that Dukkha is universal. It isn't me specifically having some sort of problem, not the usual way of I'm having this problem, but 
problems just are. So if we go inside of ourselves and investigate the dukkha which has arisen, at least we are acknowledging the first noble truth. And then, if that investigation goes a little further, we might be able to figure out why this dukkha has arisen. And if we don't blame whoever has made it arise, or whatever has made it arise, if it's a situation or a person, but instead of realizing that the dukkha has arisen because we don't want things the way we are, they are, but we want them differently. If that comes to our recognition, then we are at least acknowledging the second noble truth, that there's only one single cause for dukkha, namely craving. And craving means nothing else except wanting. Wanting that which we think is desirable and trying to get rid of that which we think is undesirable. And instead of accepting whatever there is and not reacting towards it, we react with resistance, not wanting, or clinging, wanting to keep. So if we see that within ourselves, at least we have seen the first two noble truths and have recognized them as something that we can use, except and not as something that we learn by heart. If we only learn it by heart and repeat it, it's meaningless. If we know it within ourselves, then at least we can transmit it. It has meaning. It has life. When the Buddha sat under the Bodhi tree and became enlightened, he saw the Four Noble Truths within himself. He saw them as an inner vision, not as a set of words. The knowledge and vision of things the way they are is the recognition of truth within oneself. Vision means inner seeing. There is no value in outer seeing. Outer seeing is a sense contact. Inner seeing is wisdom. So then, if we have seen the first two noble truths, maybe that will give us the incentive to say, well, if the first two are right, then maybe the next two are correct too. But only if one has really seen them within oneself will one say that. Until then, one will accept it as a set of traditional words which have been handed down from generation to generation and which would be sacrilege to doubt. That's not useful. Doesn't help anybody. Doesn't help the one who has that idea, nor does it help the next one who's supposed to inherit it. But when one has seen them to be the truth for oneself, then the understanding that the other two are also true helps one to get on the path. And that's all that's really important. Now the third one is something which nobody really believes in. We don't doubt the fact that the Buddha was enlightened, that he attained Nirvana. We don't doubt that Sariputra and Mughalana were enlightened and attained Nirvana. But we doubt very much that we ourselves can attain Nirvana. In fact, we are thinking, that we are not even thinking that such a thing is possible. We don't even have the incentive inside of ourselves to do something about it. Now, unless one believes in the impossible, one isn't going to stretch one's mind and heart. Fifty years ago, nobody would have believed that it was possible to go to the moon. Nobody. Anybody would have talked about it, would have said, 
Mm. He's a dreamer. He's a fantastic. He doesn't know what he's talking about. It's not possible to go to the moon. And yet, 25 years ago, people started saying, yes, it is possible. And the scientists said, no, it's not the impossible. There are certain obstacles. There are certain difficulties. But they can be overcome. And by believing that they can be overcome, they overcame them. Please, relate that same to yourself and Nirvana. It's not impossible. It's difficult. There are obstacles. There are innumerable obstacles. But if it were impossible, why would it have been the third noble truth? And the four noble truths were not preached to special people. They were preached to people like us, ordinary people, probably not even very well educated. In those days, education was neither compulsory nor was it very common. So it has nothing to do with education. And certainly has nothing to do with the language one speaks. You don't even know for sure what language the Buddha spoke. Pali is a conglomerate of the dialect that was spoken in the area where he lived. So if we can just stretch our mind and have an idea that the impossible is possible, we're at least on the right track. And we're not ignoring the third noble truth completely. And then we are making a reality of following the fourth noble truth. Then we are going to try to actualize it within ourselves. And we may know it by heart, and all the school children do. And once, when I was teaching in a school here, I asked the girls whether they knew the Noble Eightfold Path, and they could recite it extremely well. And then I said, and how do you do it in your daily life? And there wasn't a single answer. Totally absurd for them to think that that's what they learn in school should be used in daily life. This is the danger of the too familiar, when things become too familiar to one. The actualization and manifestation of the Noble Eightfold Path is that which makes the impossible possible. It takes a bit of doing. You know that the teaching is divided into Sila Samadhi and Panda, moral conduct, concentration and wisdom. But the Noble Eightfold Path starts with wisdom. One needs enough wisdom to get on the path. Nobody who has got enough wisdom will get on the path. The first thing that makes one get onto the path is the right view of knowing that this is the only worthwhile thing to follow. That this is the jewel which makes life worthwhile. That this is the jewel that the only one worth searching for. All other jewels which can be bought all other jewels which we might accumulate are nothing in comparison to this one. This is the real one. So that's right view. And this right view will make one get onto the path. It has embedded in it the right view of knowing that one is the owner of one's own karma. 
that whatever we do, that's what we're going to have the result. We're not the owners of anybody else's karma. It doesn't matter what anybody else is doing, it's their karma. It only depends what we ourselves are doing. And when we get that kind of view, then of course, we'll certainly start practicing. Practicing Buddhism is almost an anachronism. One can't practice Buddhism. In the Buddha's day, there wasn't such a thing as an ism. There was only Sila, Samadhi and Panya. That's Buddhism. So Panya, this wisdom, which makes it possible for us to get onto that path, in the end, will result in the right view of self. So you can look upon the Noble Eightfold Path as a circular movement which goes from the relative right view to the absolute. But without the relative right view, nobody's going to get on it. Everybody is looking for material advancement, for having more instead of being more. Now you see, even this idea of making merit, it's an idea of having more merit. It should be an idea of being more meritorious. The difference between having and being. It's a very important differentiation which everyone should think about. Having more merit is a self-centered idea, but becoming a more meritorious person is a growth idea. Unless we have an idea of growing towards Nirvana, we're going to deteriorate. Nothing in this world stands still. Either we grow or we decay. This life this human life that we are blessed with, where we have a human rebirth with all senses and the body intact, where we have the opportunity to hear the true Dhamma, where we have even an inner urge to find the truth. This human life is the greatest opportunity we have. And as we have this great opportunity, then we mustn't waste it. We must be aware all the time that if we don't practice, if we don't actually do something, we may not have this opportunity again. And the practice means that we are deliberately going on the path towards Nirvana, quite immaterial how far we get on that path. That doesn't matter. If you want to take a journey, and it's a very difficult and hazardous journey, and you know at least the destination, you may not be able to get to the end, to that destination, but at least you must get on the right road to go there. And another thing that one needs to do when one goes on this journey is to enjoy the trip. If one doesn't enjoy every moment of the trip, it's going to become a very tedious and a very difficult undertaking from which one would like to be released as soon as possible. But if one enjoys the journey, then it doesn't matter so much if one actually gets to the end of it, because one is enjoying the trip. And why can we enjoy and how can we enjoy this trip? Because we can know, if we have right view, that this is the only trip we're taking. 
All other trips are side trips, side issues. And some of them are duties and responsibilities, and most of them are search for pleasure. But if we have the right view that this is the only worthwhile one, then we will enjoy it because we know that we are on it. We are doing the one thing worth doing. The right view tells us that this is the way to go, that we are the owners of our own karma, and that we must embrace this precious human rebirth. And that the only time we've got to practice it is now. There is no other time. The past is irrevocably gone, and the future has not yet come. The future may never come. We don't know how long we're going to be here. So the only time we have is now. The urgency has to arrive in one part to do it. And then, when we have that much right view, the right intention will be our right motivation. Our right motivation, which will keep us on the straight and narrow where only good karma is being made. Now, to make only good karma depends strictly upon the motive behind what we're doing. It isn't so much what we're doing, it's why we're doing it. There can be two things done exactly the same by two different people, and yet they won't have the same results. You can imagine a robber waiting in a forest to rob someone. And then someone comes who he thinks has valuable gun, and with a huge knife, he cuts open his stomach, kills him, and takes away his valuable jewel and money. By the same token, Someone had to enter hospital. A surgeon cut open his stomach with a huge knife and killed the person. And also had, afterwards, quite an amount of that surgery occurred. The same result, totally different karma. The intentions were entirely different. And yet you've got two dead people. It isn't what one does, it's the intention behind it that comes. Karma or Mahatma declare its intention. So every time you do something, examine the intention. But the examining of the intention is not all that easy. Our motives are very hidden. We kid ourselves. We're doing it for others. We're doing it for some altruistic reason. And in reality, we're having selfish reasons behind it. It needs to be examined carefully. And when we examine it, we may be able to change something. This is all part of wisdom. Part of wisdom which arises through practice. Wisdom it's not something that we get born with, nor does it have much to do with knowledge. Knowledge sometimes helps. If we amass some knowledge, especially if we learn some of the Buddha's teachings by heart, and then memorize them, and then try to involve ourselves with them, to make them our own. Then knowledge breeds wisdom. But if knowledge remains knowledge, just knowing, without getting personally involved, without making it one's own thing where one can live accordingly, where one can examine it, investigate it, and find the truth of it in oneself, 
then the knowledge has no real repercussion, has no real result. So for knowledge can come wisdom, but knowledge and wisdom are certainly not synonymous. Wisdom comes from inner introspection, from involving oneself with the highest truth, investigating it, making it one's own, and trying to live up to it. And this is the crux of the matter, trying to live up to it. Certainly not easy because our instincts are against it. But if we don't go beyond the instincts, we're not going to live according to the Buddha's teaching. The second part of the Noble Eightfold Path concerns our moral conduct, right action, right speech, right livelihood. And all of it is, of course, connected with the precepts. Acting rightly has to do with knowing our motivation. Acting rightly means that we do not put ourselves in the center of it all, but realize that we can be a help to others. That kind of action always brings happiness. The action of help. But if we do it in order to attain some notoriety, fame, if we do it because we want to be praised, it loses all its value. It has to be done strictly for the reason of doing it. It can't be done for any other reason. If it needs any other affirmation, it no longer brings the result one is looking for. The same goes for generosity, which is of course right action. If one is generous only so that others will know it, or that there is some merit, or that there is some praise, then the generosity itself loses all its value. Generosity has this value in the act of letting go, in the act of giving away. In the end, all of us have to let go everything, all one's belongings, all one's family, and one's own body has to be let go of in the end. There's nothing left. So we might as well practice now. Generosity is letting go and therefore has great value because Nibbana means letting go of everything. Nibbana is non-clinging. And if we want to be on the way to Nibbana, we have to be on the way to non-clinging. Generosity has to have one cause, one reason only, non-clinging. Not keeping, but giving it away. And if we have that kind of idea about our actions, that we want to make them non-clinging, that they are not, that they're not designed to keep our own things, they're not designed to keep our time for ourselves, our abilities, but that we are able to let go and give away, then we are on the right path. While in the precept, we are told not to use wrong speech, here we have right speech. And right speech is the positive answer to those kinds of speech that are wrong. The Buddha has a very interesting thing to say about right speech. He says like this, if you know anything that could be hurtful to another person and is untrue, don't say it. If you know anything that could be helpful to another person and is untrue, don't say it. If you know anything that could be hurtful 
to another person that it's true, don't say it. But one doesn't speak or answer impetuously, quickly, instinctively, but that one finds the time when the other person is receptive, can accept, when the other person is feeling at ease, and mainly and most importantly, when oneself has only loving feelings towards that person. If one speaks to another person while one is angry with them, or feels at all put out to gossip them, the words will have no effect, or rather, they will have ill effect. The other person will also get angry. And then there is nothing gained at all, except possibly an enemy made out of a friend. So right speech is our connection with all the other people that we contact, and therefore of such importance. Another interesting thing about speech is the fact that only 7% of speech has been found to be our communication. Only the, the, the words themselves are only 7%. The other 93% are the tone of voice, the body language, the facial expression, and the feeling behind the words. So whatever one says, one can't hide what one's really thinking. And this is one of the interesting factors of the human being and its behavior, that we're all thinking that our thoughts are secret. And that is a complete misconstruction of the fact. People can feel and see the thoughts, even though they don't know that they are doing it. We can see and feel them in body language, facial expression, tone of voice, and the feeling which comes out from the words. The words themselves may be totally true, but they may have no effect whatsoever because they're totally negated by what comes out behind them. This interesting fact has been studied and uh, found to be so in communication workshops where this has been um, used as a means of instructing people how to relate better to each other. It's a great um, cause for unhappiness to think that people need to learn how to relate to each other. But it's nothing new because the Buddha often spoke about the value and blessing of right speech and the misery of wrong speech. So it hasn't come about only in our generation, it's two and a half thousand years old. Speech is not being an orator. That's got nothing to do with right speech. That's just an ability or a gift. Right speech is our everyday connection with each other. And it has to be thought out and used in the most effective manner, not impulsively. Now, we all know about right livelihood, and we are aware of the fact that the livelihood one has should not break any of the five precepts. In the Buddha's time, there weren't so many different livelihoods. He mentions 18, which are wrong, and most of those are not even available to us anymore. But we have innumerable others which are available to us, which have to do with lying and cheating, with killing, with uh, intoxicants, and we must abstain from them, not for the, only for the reason that the livelihood itself may hurt others. The most important reason is that it hurts ourselves. If a person works in an abattoir and has to kill animals every day, all day long, 
he obviously has to get hardened to the misery of those animals. He's not only hurting the animals, he's hurting himself far more than anyone else. He becomes hard and cruel, and compassion is no longer part of his being. If someone has to work in a capacity where he has to lie in order to make a living, obviously truth can no longer be part of his life then, because he becomes used to lying. And the last aspect of the Noble Eightfold Path leads us to meditation. The first one is the right effort. Well, the effort which we can make in life can also be wrong. There's a lot of effort to be made to become rich. It takes a lot of effort to pretty oneself up, takes a lot of effort to uh, have all the things that are available in shops. All these are efforts which take a lot of energy, but are certainly not classified as right effort. Right effort means, in the Buddhist language, only one thing. Not to let an unwholesome thought arise which has not yet arisen. Not to let an unwholesome thought continue which has already arisen. To make a wholesome thought arise which has not yet arisen. To make a wholesome thought continue which has already arisen. That's the only thing that means right effort in the Buddhist language. That means purifying our own thoughts. It means knowing that our thoughts are not to be taken for granted, that our thoughts are something that we can direct, that our thoughts when they say, I don't want, I'm bored, I can't stand it, I hate it, I don't want any part of it, I'm afraid of it, I'm anxious about it, all these can be changed into something positive. The wholesome can be generated and the unwholesome can be dropped. This is the only thing that the Buddha means when he says right effort. Right mindfulness. The word mindfulness is bandied about a lot. The word mindfulness is used especially when we say it in Pali, sati. It's nice, short, succinct. And everybody knows that it has something to do with the Satipatthana Sutta. But it's got something far more to do with every person. It's a mental formation. It's a mind state. It's a state of mind that every person should bring about within themselves. Mindfulness is the one way towards the purification of being towards the overcoming of pain, grief, and lamentation, towards the elimination of dukkha, towards entering the noble path, towards attaining nibbana. Mindfulness is the one way. Mindfulness means awareness of oneself, awareness of what one is thinking, what one is feeling, what one is doing and whether what one is thinking is actually wholesome or whether it's egocentric. That's mindfulness. Those are the four foundations. Those are the satipatthana. What one is doing, what one is thinking, what one is feeling and whether what one is thinking is actually wholesome. Anybody can do it, most people don't. Why not? Because it takes a bit of effort. And it does not promise any pleasurable sensation. It's on the way to Nibbana. And pleasure and happiness are not synonymous. Pleasure is one thing, 
Happiness is another. Pleasure is built on sense contact. Happiness is built on purity. Mindfulness is the way to purity. It's not a thing which most people even attempt to do. And most people don't even know how to do it. Watch every step you take. Watch when you move. Watch what you're thinking. Watch what you're feeling. Become aware of it and drop the unwholesome. But don't suppress and don't pretend. Don't pretend to be nice, to be pure, to be sweet. Nobody is. Everybody's got defilements. Only the Arahant is. No use pretending. It only makes it worse because it creates an awful lot of tension inside of oneself. To pretend to be one thing and actually to be another. It's not a great deal of ease in that. Mindfulness is something we learn through meditation. The last step on the Noble Eightfold Path is right concentration. And right concentration means success in meditation. It doesn't mean the training in meditation means the success, the jhana, the absorption. And one can only do it with right mindfulness. When mindfulness has been established, meditation works. When the mindfulness has been established, then the path can be trodden successfully. One mustn't look at the Noble Eightfold Path as a ladder that one has to first get finished with one rung and then get to the next one. It's far more an eight-lane highway. On all lanes, one can drive forward. All eight have to be practiced. Right concentration means that we've got to start meditating somewhere along the line. And we mustn't leave it until one is either retired or has got the kids married or one has more time or the weather gets better. Who knows how long we're going to be around. Life is very uncertain. Death is certain. These are truisms which the Buddha pronounced over and over again because everybody likes to forget. Nobody likes to remember these things because they do not promise any pleasure. We are pleasure orientated reactors. That's all. We've got to get past that into the reality of what can be within our own heart. When purity arises, happiness arises. When sense contacts arise, pleasure or displeasure arises. We have to make a choice. The choice is obvious, but it's the one that's a little more difficult. It takes a little more doing. It takes a little less sleep. It takes a little more letting go. It takes a little less self-importance. So therefore it's a little more difficult. But it promises the complete ending of all dukkha. And unless we practice what we so often hear preach, the Dhamma will die. Because it dies with everyone who hasn't practiced. And it comes alive again with everyone who does. If you would like to leave a valuable heritage to those who come after you, if you want to leave a heritage which is really important, then the best you can leave is the practice of the Dhamma. Only those who have practiced can leave this behind. If the Buddha hadn't practiced what he was preaching, his words would have had no impact whatsoever. The words are only 7% of the communication. And because of that, we still need and have life teachers. Today in the West, we wouldn't need them. We've got so surface television. We wouldn't need a single life teacher. But we still have them. 
because it's the impact of the reality, of the wisdom, of the person that's speaking, which makes all the difference. In the Buddha's time, people listened to one sermon and became enlightened. They had practice, but it was the impact of the Buddha's strength that made it. Because the same words are available to us, and they make no difference whatsoever. We are still as unenlightened as before. So when we really want to have the truth of the Dhamma within our own lives and those that come after us, we've got to start somewhere. We've got to start with that which is the center of the teaching, the hub of the Dhamma wheel, the hub of the wheel of the Four Noble Truths. And we have the practice of it, right there in the palm of our hand, the eight steps, all of them to be practiced simultaneously. The right view of karma, the right view that it's got to be done, the right intention behind what we're doing, the introspection to find out, the right speech, the right action, the right livelihood, the right effort for our thoughts and thinking, the mindfulness which needs to be practiced all day long, watching oneself, guarding oneself, knowing oneself to be fallible and constantly making adjustments, and then meditation. I'd like to give you a chance to ask me some questions if you like, and then I can explain to you something about meditation and you can give it a go.